First of all, my name is Jeff Ezell. I'm the Vice President of Operations for the S2 Institute and Critical Intervention Services. Uh, personally, we'd like to thank you, uh, each and every one of you, for taking time out of your busy schedules this morning, and we truly hope that we can provide some in, uh, useful insight on today's important topic. Some of you may or may not know Craig Gundry is the Vice President of Special Projects for Critical Intervention Services and a security consultant with over 30 years of specialized focus on managing risk of mass homicide. In addition, he is an expert witness and was a committee member for ASIS International's new WVPI 2020 AA, which is the Workplace Violence and Active Assailant Standard. Craig is the architect of many of our unique risk management programs, including the Guardian Safe School Program and Guardian Safe Workplace Program, which both are fully integrated protective strategies to mitigate targeted violence in our schools and workplace, as well as the ATO or Anti-Terrorism Officer and Critical Infrastructure Protection Program. He's a columnist for Workplace Violence Today magazine, a TEDx presenter, news media commentator, and frequent speaker at conferences worldwide on topics related to mass homicide. He is a lead instructor for the S2 Safety and Intelligence Institute and has trained over 5,000 professionals worldwide in anti-terrorism and active shooter related topics. So without further ado, I give you Mr. Craig Gundry. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be in the world joining us for this program. Um, let me first say I thank you very much for joining us. It's an honor to be here presenting for you today. Now, before we begin, let me just say that the program that I'll be presenting this morning is um, actually an extract from a larger program that I've taught for many years now, which is normally four hours in length, encompassing a very broad spectrum of issues as it relates to active shooter-related violence. Um, obviously, for the sake of time, we're going to have to condense our focus just a little bit, but I just want to kind of start on the footing of discussing risk management overall. When we talk about workplace violence or when we talk about terrorism or any other potential source of, um, of uh, a threat potentially resulting in mass homicide, we ideally want to be employing multiple layers of protective measures aimed at both reducing the probability of risk events and the criticality of risk events. Proactively, in terms of workplace violence, if we're talking about type 3 workplace violence, for instance, employee versus employee, former employees, that can encompass everything from our HR policies and practices, having an effective framework of workplace violence prevention policies in, in place, employee assistance programs, threat assessment and management plans, and other similar types of matters. If we're concerned about terrorism-related violence or non-ideological uh, outsider adversaries, then suspicious activity reporting and detection would be another one of our proactive protective measures as well. And then we have physical security and access control, various types of facility protective measures in terms of facility design and infrastructure preparation, and then various different types of emergency response preparations such as emergency response plans, training our staff in effective response measures, and post-incident preparations as well. Business continuity plans, uh, plans for managing the news media, and even to the level of things like insurance. Now, again, because of the short duration of time today, I really don't have an opportunity to explore all these different issues at uh, any level of substance. So instead, what I would like to do is focus very narrowly today on specifically physical security matters, facility design, and facility infrastructure. There are many excellent sources out there, um, good starting points at least, for designing other protective measures related to these other items that I discussed. Jeff mentioned earlier uh, ACES International's new uh, WVPI 2020 AA. That's an excellent um, source um, to begin structuring a workplace violence prevention intervention program. The Department of Homeland Security has quite a bit of uh, educational material out there on the subject of surveillance detection and suspicious activity recognition and reporting. And um, there's many different sources out there for direction in terms of planning and responding to active shooter attacks, educating employees and developing emergency response plans. Department of Homeland Security has publications out there on this matter. And there's numerous instructors out there these days teaching programs in the workplace for employees. In fact, I know from looking at the attendee list that uh, 
several colleagues that are on this call this morning. That is one of their fortes. So instead, I would like to focus on this, what is often an overlooked or at least underappreciated issue in active shooter response planning. And that is the actual design of our facilities themselves and our physical security measures. Now, before we start talking about specific protective measures, I just want to kind of set the context a little bit by talking about physical security principles and how that applies to active shooter response uh, planning and also the performance during different types of... Um, okay, thank you very much. Somehow I ended up muted. I uh, don't know how that happened. I'm not quite sure where I left off before that occurred. Um, but uh, just reiterating what I said a moment ago, before we start talking about specific protective measures, I want to set the context of this a little bit by discussing some basic physical security principles and how they apply to active shooter attacks. Now, conceptually, protecting against active shooter attacks requires that we use a performance-oriented approach to integrating detection, delay, and response elements in a manner that an attack can be interrupted before mass homicide is in progress. At least this will be our ideal aim in physical security design. And that's kind of represented by this diagram that you see on slide right now, where we have an attack that commences um, all the way over on the left-hand side of this diagram. Then we have the first point where the attack is detected and reporting begins. And that's what really kind of starts the clock in terms of our response to this overall incident. And then there's going to be a period of time while it's being reported to the authorities or a security control room or an attack is recognized and a response force is deployed. And that's represented by the letters TA on slide right now. And then we have the actual travel time for the response force, whether that's off-site police or happens to be an on-site um, armed response force maybe. And then the actual interruption of the attacker. And that is represented by the letter T-I. Now, above that, we have the actual intrusion itself. And the time along that adversary's path before mass homicide commences, perhaps being delayed by barriers and distance, ultimately uh, results in the commencement of mass homicide, and that's represented by the letters T-C. Now, in an ideal physical security design, T-I interruption occurs before mass killing is in progress. Unfortunately, in the real world, what we often see is a situation like this, where TC occurs before TI, and mass homicide commences before police arrive on scene or before the armed response force can effectively intervene. And we can actually quantify what the consequences of that variance is at approximately one victim every 15 seconds, according to a couple of different studies. So our ultimate aim in physical security design is to narrow the gap as much as possible between TI and TC with the ultimate aim of reducing the number of potential casualties and bringing the event to a resolution as quickly as possible. And that, again, kind of requires a multidimensional approach to how we implement different types of physical security measures um, in our facilities. And when we look at previous incidents, we can see that mathematics actually bore out in timelines, looking at the time that attacks have commenced, ultimately resulting, or when mass homicide was in progress, and then the actual time that was required for police, um, maybe school resource officers in a school or an armed response force to intervene and stop the adversary. And if we, uh, I'm not going to walk through each one of these case studies for sake of time, but I just want you to get an appreciation for the way this plays out in the real world. Now, the, if you look at the red row on this slide, that is the time between the time that the adversary entered or uh, uh, into the facility and commenced mass homicide, when mass killing was in full progress. And in each one of these events, we see that it's between one minute to approximately three minutes. And truthfully, um, case studying many of these events over the years, it's usually under one minute to approximately two minutes time period. And this is what we would call the adversary task time. And below that in the blue rows is the actual response times, looking at the actual first calls to 911 or 999 or the time that um, security forces were aware that an attack was in progress then the actual dispatch and travel time, 
and then the actual time it took for them to locate the attacker or move to the attacker's location, and sometimes it's after the attackers committed suicide, in essence, where they were in a uh, position in order to uh, neutralize the adversary. And at the very bottom of this, we see the on-scene response time, which would be the time that maybe authorities arrived on scene or perhaps that security was at the building itself. And then below that, what I call the effective response time. Truthfully, the uh, on-scene response times in these kinds of events, which is often what you find reported, for instance, in FBI publications and otherwise, truthfully doesn't really matter to me. What time the uh, police arrived on scene after they were dispatched is kind of irrelevant. What ultimately matters is the time that they entered the building, found the bad guy, and were in position in order to neutralize the bad guy. And in this case, we can see times varying anywhere from 7 all the way up to 38 minutes. And we continue to see this same kind of dynamic, not just in workplace shootings, but we see it in previous attacks directed against schools. One to two minutes, quite typical in terms of the adversary task time, mass killing in progress. And in this example up here, anywhere from seven minutes all the way up to 110 minutes, for instance, in the Columbine shooting. We see it in attacks against houses of worship. Again, one to two minutes, adversary task time, mass killing in progress. And effective response times anywhere between five minutes to 10 minutes in, or 13 minutes in this example. And in attacks all over the world. On slide right now are an example of four well-documented attacks in Europe. Charlie Hebdo, the Atoya Island incident, the uh, school shooting at the Albertville Real School in Germany, and also the Bataclan Theater in 2015. And we see the exact same dynamic over and over. One to two minute adversary task time, effective response times, five minutes, seven minutes being quite typical, all the way up to a couple hours in some cases. Now, putting this all kind of in a practical context, there's several key objectives in our preparations and our security design. First is implementing measures to ensure early detection and rapid alert communications. This is, in essence, our detection function. And this includes both rapid alert to the response force, whether that's off-site police or on-site security, as well as also rapid alert to our employees and any kind of facility occupants to initiate their response as quickly as possible. Then we want to have measures in place in order to delay the adversary's ingress into populated areas. And that's primarily going to be facilitated by distance and barrier construction. Then facilitate rapid evacuation of employees in the public. And that is, in essence, a delay measure, creating distance between the bad guy and the, uh, the population that he's trying to target. And then facilitating safe refuge in employees in the public unable to safely evacuate or who are unaware of where the threat may be located at. And this also is a form of delay. And then reduce the effective response time by rapidly deploying a response force capable of neutralizing the adversary. And that's our response function. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to... Uh, uh, really get into outdoor protective measures in this program, um, as well as also some other things that quite often I do in the more uh, extensive versions of this, uh, of this presentation, such as indoor uh, 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 deployable delay measures, um, um, suppression, and other similar types of matters. Instead, because of the sake of time, I want to focus specifically on protective measures that are universal to all of our facilities. doesn't matter whether we're protecting a house of worship whether we're protecting a school or an office, um, maybe even in a multi-tenant building, things that will be universal to all of us. Now, ideally, entrance into our facility should all be monitored to a limited number of uh, entry control points, allowing more effective use of interior barriers to delay the adversary's ingress and also provide for better opportunity for early detection. And for many facilities, the first protective layer that will be protecting indoor building occupants will be the exterior building facade. And um, this is where I often run into a lot of problems with a lot of facilities, is the extensive use of glass glazing in, uh, in exterior facade design, but also and this extends to indoor partition walls inside of buildings as well. Tempered glass, quite typically used in commercial construction, provides very minimal delay against a gunman employing firearm projectile in order to facilitate entry. 
Critical Intervention Services, we did um, tests a couple of years back with a window film manufacturer, testing both film-reinforced windows as well as non-reinforced, uh, just standard tempered glass uh, windows. And our delay times were only about 10 seconds. Basically, one shot, what happens is the tempered glass becomes hugely fragile, and all somebody needs to do is hit it at that point, and it falls directly to the ground. And that was actually how Adam Lanza entered Sandy Hook Elementary School back in 2012. He didn't try to enter through the locked front doors. He just simply fired a shot or two through the adjacent glass, stepped right through and into the lobby. Probably maximum delay time, again, somewhere probably around 9, 10 seconds. Now, if we have glass glazing that we are going to be relying on to provide us with some kind of delay benefit in these situations, we ideally want to be employing protective glazing that can provide a, a more robust or at least a more effective, useful level of delay. And there's several options out there to consider. When budget permits, perhaps in new building construction or in certain types of upgrade situations, laminated glass will always be the, uh, the optimal choice. Essentially, a... Uh, it is um, uh, constructed as a PVB or polycarbonate interlayer sandwich between layers of glass. And depending upon the tools that the adversary is using for entry can provide up to minutes of delay. Against the gunman, just simply using a firearm projectile and uh, impact force will provide very substantial delay. The next option would be polycarbonate glazing, um, which is a polymer-based material often sold under the trade name Lexan, but there's many manufacturers. 300 times the impact resistance of glass um, and can provide also up to several minutes of delay against a uh, adversary using um, particularly, um, I, I, let me pause for a moment and say polycarbonate is somewhat vulnerable to uh, destruction by shotgun. I've seen some tests of this. However, against AR-15 rifles and against handguns or whatnot will uh, provide pretty robust protection as well. Now, where I most often recommend polycarbonate when working with clients is usually in situations where we've got um, miscellaneous windows in different areas, indoor areas throughout buildings that we just want to improve their level of intrusion resistance, basically replacing uh, existing tempered glass windows, door vision panels being a really good example of this in schools. Where polycarbonate doesn't really work well is in outdoor applications mainly because it um, degrades with UV exposure. Also in locations where it's going to be susceptible to uh, a lot of people walking by and brushing and things like this because it is not very scratch resistant. So we would not want to use polycarbonate for turnstiles, for instance. That's where laminated glass would definitely be a, uh, an improvement. And then if we do have a lot of tempered glass glazing and we don't have the budget for uh, retrofit with laminated glass, Anti-shatter film, properly attached, either using mechanical frame attachment or using a cement bond attachment, can also provide us with an improvement in terms of our delay. In the test that we conducted as an organization gave us some, depending upon the, uh, the aggressiveness of our penetration tester. In fact, uh, one of the tests that we did, I uh, see that the penetration tester is actually in on this call today. Larry. Um, gave us between 45 and 90 seconds of delay time in those instances. The uh, weakness of anti-shatter film is it's vulnerable to um, heavy, high-mass bladed objects. So for machetes, axes, anything like this, what happens is the membrane tears at the same time that the glass is being shattered, and that can expedite the, uh, the breach. And on the left-hand side of the slide right now are examples of windows from the tests that we conducted. And on the right-hand side is an example of what proper attachment would look like, in this case using a mechanical uh, a frame attachment. Now, I underscore the importance. If you're going to use anti-shatter film, you need to ensure that it is properly attached to the frame. Otherwise, what will happen is the glass will be retained to the membrane, but it will just fail right at the actual edge, at the frame itself. And that's basically what we witnessed at Capitol Hill with multiple breaches of windows during the uh, January 6th riot. And this video um, illustrates this point. Okay. In that case, you can see it provided very little delay time at all. Um, in that case, maybe about 
10 seconds of delay or less. You know, not even worth the upgrade in that particular circumstance. Now, when, when working with clients, quite often we have these facilities where there's multiple different possible entry points. And very rarely do I work with a client that has an unlimited budget in order to make improvements throughout their facility. In these circumstances, main entrance protection should be a priority, especially when we're concerned about outsider adversaries. So if terrorism is our primary concern, or we're concerned about non-ideological mass murders or former employees or something like this, and, and we have had many instances in the past of attacks demonstrating this point. Very rarely do attackers, outsiders, enter the employee-only entrance in the parking garage or on the backside of the facility or enter through an emergency exit or something like this. They usually come right in through the front doors. And some examples being the attacks at the uh, Rihanna and Pulse nightclubs, Charlie Hebdo, the Curtis Colwell Center in, in Garland, Texas, San Bernardino, the Inland Regional Center, the Colorado Springs Planned Parenthood uh, a Clinic, Bataclan Theater, the Center Block Parliament Building in uh, Ottawa, Sandy Hook Elementary School, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in 2009, and numerous other uh, attacks that have uh, uh, occurred over the years as well. Now, to, uh, to address this issue, we want to ensure that we design our lobbies and reception areas as independent protective layers, meaning in essence that there is a system of barriers, walls, doors, locks, and other similar controls that will delay an adversary entering through one of these public reception areas from progressing into occupied spaces of the building. And then we can facilitate entry through the use of access control systems or, uh, or other similar types of means. So this basically entails ensuring that we have intrusion-resistant doors, turnstiles, um, uh, indoor, that any types of uh, indoor partition walls are all constructed of intrusion-resistant materials. Waiting areas in lobbies and other reception areas should be located ideally away from main entrance doors and with close access to alternative exits. Because if we have gunmen that suddenly walk through the front door and our design is effective, then anybody inside of the lobby is going to be trapped with that gunman at that point. And this at least provides alternative escape routes for people in these areas. I also ideally like it if whoever it is that's handling reception, whether that's a receptionist or maybe a security officer, has a location immediately near their desk that they can take quick refuge as well. Um, the most ideal for this purpose would be an independent office or maybe a storeroom that is unlocked so that it's easily accessible and can be easily locked from the inside without a key. And also ideally with a phone so that they can report the, uh, the attack that is in progress. Utilizing a panic button can also be a, uh, an excellent way of expediting initial response at reception desks. Um, whether that be to notify police um, of, a, uh, of an emergency or perhaps also just to alert the control room so that they can assess the event at that point and dispatch perhaps an on on-site armed response force. Now, CCTV, if monitored live from a control room, should also allow or facilitate rapid assessment of that panic alarm when it's activated. And the implementation of gunshot detection technology can also expedite this type of alert as well. Um, most ideally, if it is used in conjunction with the security control room, that can assess it when it is being when it is activated. And there's many different types of gunshot detection uh, systems that are out there on the market today. This is actually a uh, an area within the security market that has been growing rapidly over the last ten years, utilizing different types of technologies. We have um, optical uh, sensor systems, electro-optical sensor systems, and then acoustic sensor systems as well. For outdoor applications, I usually lean towards uh, acoustic sensors, mainly because um, they just provide better coverage you know, as far as area is concerned, more, uh, more value, as it were, for the investment. And quite often in that case, I don't necessarily need to know exactly where an attack is occurring Simply knowing that an attack is occurring outdoors is often sufficient so we can initiate a building lockdown. Indoors, however, it is usually going to be optical or dual text sensors that would be employed for this kind of purpose. Now, some of the systems that are out there on the market have independent monitoring and alerting systems. Others are designed to integrate with uh, security management systems, functioning in essence similar to any other kind of alarm sensor as it were. 
that's usually my kind of preferred approach in these circumstances because those systems that are reliant on an off-site assessment usually don't provide the, um, the, 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 the benefit that we're seeking in terms of expediting response because there's time involved for them to assess it and notify the authorities, dispatch the authorities, and this kind of thing. And here's an example of one dual technology type sensor that might be employed um, in a lobby area. And if we're going to be installing gunshot detection sensors indoors inside of buildings, you know, unless we have this great budget in order to install them extensively throughout the inside of our facilities, lobbies would be a key area. Because again, this is one location where a large number of attacks commence. And this diagram kind of illustrates how a secure lobby design works in a very simple manner. You know, in this case, we have um, a, a, a contiguous protective layer securing the lobby from the inside occupied spaces of the building with a locked door or perhaps a turnstile controlling access into those occupied spaces, a reception desk with a panic button available so that the receptionist can activate it immediately when the threat is recognized, and then an area, a uh, office or storeroom immediately behind the reception desk where that receptionist or that security officer can take refuge, alternative exits so that people that are caught inside of this environment have a way of escaping and CCTV view to facilitate um, assessment of that panic button. And this kind of illustrates to me basically how the actions would uh, you know, occur. So the gunman enters through the front door, people have escaped from the waiting area outside the alternative exits. The door to the secured spaces inside of our building, occupied spaces remain closed and locked. And the receptionist activates the panic alarm and then takes refuge inside of the storeroom or inside of the office. And this gives an example of how we've applied this type of approach in, uh, in, a, in a practical uh, context um, working for a client. In this instance, we had a headquarters building for a corporation that had uh, optical turnstiles in their lobby uh, to facilitate the entry of employees coming in through the main entrance doors. And adjacent to that is a reception desk with a security officer. Well, in this instance, we have no delay at all. Optical turnstiles don't do anything to stop or slow an, uh, an active shooter entering through the front doors of the building. So the recommendation that we made in this particular case was to install an intrusion-resistant turnstile. Um, and in this case, we also had to put in an additional emergency exit door. We put in another door then for use by the security officer to take refuge when an attack actually uh, uh, in initiated. It required moving the uh, reception desk a little bit in order to make clearance for some of the, this new construction. Basically illustrates all the key points that I described before. The only thing that really we didn't integrate into this uh, recommended improvement was um, alternative emergency exit doors. Um, for a various different reasons, it just wasn't practical in this particular situation to do so. But fortunately, I really didn't see the large numbers of people that were waiting at different periods of the day when I was out there doing my assessment for this facility. And here's another example too, another uh, corporate client, in this case, a uh, large headquarters building. And again, we had no delay at all. And this building presented a particular concern for me because most of the workspaces inside were large open uh, uh, rooms, similar to call centers with uh, cubicles providing for employee workspaces. So once an adversary got beyond this reception point, they were free throughout the building. There was no other delay. So in this instance, it required actually um, implementing several different kinds of measures. One, um, we had to address that glazing on the side of the lobby. And the most cost-effective way to do that in this case was with the use of anti-shatter film. And then second was building a wall with turnstiles and additional emergency exit doors to control entrance into the employee-occupied spaces. And this is the final product when the, uh, the upgrades were all complete. So we have Lexan uh, turnstiles in this case, um, film-reinforced uh, glass sections adjacent to the lobby, and laminated uh, glass emergency exit doors that were installed to facilitate um, emergency egress. There was also originally a couple planters that were located close to this location that could have served as climbing aids. And so they were removed and additional potential climbing aids were also moved away. Trash cans, things like that. Now, <clears throat> let me make a note um, on this wall. This wall is not significantly high. Yet in this particular instance, we had an armed security officer that was located in their proximity on the inside of where that wall is located. 
So in that type of circumstance, having a, an armed, quote unquote, overwatch capability at that barrier would have been quite effective. But in other cases, um, I would have maybe been looking for a little bit more height in order to impair or delay an adversary further. We also want to ensure as a basic preparation measure that we have adequate and abundant availability of rooms inside of our facility where employees can take safe refuge when an attack is in progress. Now, following in alignment with uh, the DHS guidelines, you know, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the simple one syllable words, run, hide, fight, um, or what I typically like to call when I'm doing active shooter training, uh, escape, barricade, and resist. Um, escaping from the building is always going to be the preferred response. If there are means of egress that are easily recognized and people have some recognition of where the threat's located at. But quite often, that's not going to be the case in many buildings. For example, if we have people on the second, third, fourth floors of a multi-story office building, trying to escape through the lower levels of the building may actually be much more dangerous than just taking refuge in place. Also, many people assume that when attack is in progress, that we're going to have complete situational awareness. We're going to know exactly where the bad guys are and how many there are and what they're doing. And that's not the way this stuff goes down in the real world. So in these cases, we want to ensure that, um, that there's many options available for people to take refuge that can be adequately secured, what I'm calling safe rooms, um, as it were. And when I say the term safe room, I don't necessarily mean as in a VIP protection context, a room that's going to provide an advanced um, amount of delay time. I'm just talking about something that's going to delay an adversary for 45 seconds or more. And this can include offices, conference rooms, storage rooms, rest rooms, large closets. I ran into a client a couple of years ago, actually a, uh, a large European government institution that um, had extensive glass glazing um, throughout the interior of their building. Most offices were unsuitable for use as uh, safe refuge rooms for this reason. And trying to upgrade this building would have just been tremendously expensive. So instead, in that case, we ended up um, having to identify safe rooms on each floor and in each wing of that building that would meet these types of uh, 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 criteria. And um, in one, it ended up being break rooms. They were the, actually the only rooms that actually had solid partition walls that, uh, that weren't constructed of glass. And it just it meant installing some new locks on the doors. And then we uh, had to designate those and make sure as part of the training that employees knew that during an armed attack, that is where they take refuge, or that is the only safe area where they can take refuge. And this kind of uh, breaks down some of the basic criteria for a, what I'm calling a basic level safe room in these circumstances. Um, <clears throat> drop ceilings in these cases, I don't worry about. I have studied hundreds of these events over the years, and I have never found an, a terrorist armed assault yet or an active shooter attack or school shooting or anything like that where the gunman actually climbed over a drop ceiling to get at people that were inside of a locked room. Same thing with gypsum, uh, gypsum board wall construction. Gypsum board provides very little delay against forcible entry. An individual kicking their way through a gypsum board wall, gypsum board only provides around 30 to, to around 60 seconds of delay time against forced entry with no special tools. Um, usually in these kinds of attacks, adversaries use visually obvious movement routes, hallways, doors, windows, things like this. And that's where I want to emphasize um, ensuring that we have a strong level of intrusion resistance. So in this case, solid core wooden or steel doors would be sufficient. Inward or outward swinging for a basic level of delay is not really very important to me either. Um, sturdy board or mortise lock sets um, under in the United States using the A156 rating should be at least grade one to ensure an adequate level of protection against forcible entry. Um, the ANSI A, uh, uh, A156 grading system grades locks into three levels, grade one through grade three. Grade one provides the highest level of protection. Windows should ideally be smaller than 96 square inches and beyond the reach of door handles or upgraded or replaced with the use of uh, laminated glass, polycarbonate, or anti-shatter film. And whatever you do in terms of these uh, uh, potential safe rooms, Please ensure that the locks on these rooms feature a thumb turn or button for locking. 
In other words, in the United States, that would be ANSI F04 or F82, what's called office function locks, not what's called classroom function locks. That's usually not a problem in most commercial facilities that I assess, but I have run into it occasionally. I, I, first of all, let me say, I run into it extensively in schools. Major problem. For decades, architects have been using, quote unquote, classroom function locks in schools, which for reasons I'll get into in a moment, are the worst choice of locks in this situation. But I do run into it even in commercial facilities too. I just did an assessment for a hospital uh, about a month or so ago that had a, a mix of locks on different kinds of doors, including a large number of classroom function locks on offices. And the reason why this is a big issue for me, in these types of situations, life-threatening, imminent threat situations, the sympathetic nervous system gets activated. And when the sympathetic nervous system gets activated, that's our uh, primordial fight or flight um, that uh, uh, prepares us for fight or flight in response to potentially life-threatening situations. All kinds of deleterious effects occur. Difficulty with memory recall, complex problem solving, even fine motor coordination. Simply finding keys to lock a door becomes a complex task. And... As a result, we have had a number of incidents, particularly in school shootings, where doors to classrooms did not get locked for this very reason. Two incidents in particular where this contributed to unnecessary casualties was the attack at Sandy Hook Elementary School in uh, 2012 and Virginia Tech Norris Hall. Between these two events alone, 26 people were killed and 24 wounded specifically because the doors to their refuge rooms could not be quickly and easily secured. Now, amongst this casualty number that I'm giving you right now, I'm not talking about the first classrooms that got caught by surprise. These are other classrooms down the hallway that should have been locked at this point, hearing the gunfire going on nearby, but weren't, largely because keys. Teachers needing to find the keys, open the door, lock the door, that type of thing, which suddenly again becomes a complex task when that sympathetic nervous system gets activated. So the moral of the story, never use classroom function locks, only use office function locks that um, don't require any kind of complex manipulation for locking. Now, a question that comes up occasionally is what about the vulnerability of door locks to gunfire? Um, <clears throat> This is not often a major concern for me. Truthfully, it's kind of rare. Um, there have been incidents, most of the incidents that I'm familiar with, where gunmen forcibly entered into rooms to target people that were locked by the use of gunfire were usually in instances where there was a delayed intervention by security forces. Maybe they set up a perimeter around the outside, there was a siege going on, that kind of thing. And, um, or... Because of the size of the building, for instance, the amount of time it took for the response force to get out there, they basically ran out of targets. So now we have these empty corridors, and at this point, the gunmen start trying to forcibly enter into rooms to find people. And most of those were actually hotel attacks. One example was the Intercontinental Hotel in Kabul. And, um, the uh, photo on the left-hand side illustrates the destroyed lock to one of the hotel room doors in that instance. Now, the photo on the left hand or the right hand side, um, I put there for a reason. In the uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Commission's draft report, the first version that they put out um, before it was made official, somebody was making a recommendation in there that uh, mortise locks were preferred over board locks because that they were more resistant against gunfire. That's false. Patently false, in fact. In fact, the opposite is often true mainly with wooden office doors or wooden classroom doors because the mortise pockets are much more vulnerable to fracture by gunfire than they would be with a board uh, lock set. Also, we've had some cases where gunmen tried to get into offices um, with, uh, 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 by shooting out board locks, but because of the smaller target size, they actually missed. One good example was John Zawahi um, at the uh, University of Santa Monica who tried uh, getting into a room where a librarian and another staff member were taking refuge. He shot several shots at the actual door lock, missed in each case, and instead of continuing, just moved on, looking for easy targets. 
Now, if we are concerned about this, there are some things that we can do. Um, there are door reinforcement devices that are out there in the market, most of which are sold or marketed for uh, school security applications. However, um, many of them could be considered code violations, and I would uh, investigate that before implementing them as a, a solution in your facility. Um, there are also bullet-resistant cylinder guards that are manufactured out there um, by a couple different companies. Door wedges are an option. However, when it comes to door wedges, there's really only one that I recommend. I've tested a bunch of these in the past when working with schools. And truthfully, most of them are just garbage. Kick the door enough times and vibration will move it out of place and, and gunman gets inside the room. The one on screen right now is called Tack Wedge. And it is the only one that I've tested that really works well. And it works best on carpeted or hardwood or rubber type floors. Um, as I discovered in the Middle East, where we have um, where a lot of floors and hotels and places like this are um, marble or stone, it does tend to slide a little bit easier. And what I found actually kind of helps that is uh, taking a mouse pad, putting it down, and then kicking it underneath, or something similar, maybe like a piece of carpet. On the lower right hand side is a rim lock, surface mounted rim lock. That can often be the easiest solution if it's permissible by code, um, depending upon the room where it's being applied at and the circumstances. And this um, it, it is still going to be vulnerable to gunfire. However, if the gunman doesn't know where it's mounted on the opposite side of the door, it is unlikely that he'll hit it. So this can, in many circumstances, be the easiest, most cost-effective way of addressing this concern. And if we have the budget or we're in a situation where we determine that it warrants improvement of our doors to a higher level of uh, attack resistance against a gunman, as Abloy has a standard, it's a proprietary standard of theirs called 5AA10 for attack resistant door openings. I have not worked with these doors personally yet with any of my school clients, but I, um, I have dug into quite a bit the actual test protocol, watched some videos of the testing, and I got to admit, it's a really nice little standard. It is um, something I would strongly recommend. And the test protocol basically involves subjecting the lock and the window glazing to 90 shots of 7.62 millimeter, followed then by a four-minute physical attack using impact tools. And that's a beautiful uh, standard for these types of applications. Now, I have not uh, spoken with Azabloy about the different models of doors that are available out there, but all the ones that I have seen that have been tested under this standard were really designed for schools and uh, had door vision panels, as it were. So if I'm in an office type situation and I don't want to have big vision panels on all my doors, if as Abloy doesn't have other alternative models that I'm unaware of, one could probably achieve a very similar type of delay by just simply using doors constructed of similar specifications. In this case, it's a hollow metal door with a skin face and a Sergeant 8200 series mortise lock. Now, what about ballistic protection? bullet-resistant materials and door construction glazing. I Occasionally, I do end up specifying bullet-resistant barriers, and it's usually in circumstances where there's people located in a highly vulnerable area. Um, a good example might be a security control room located immediately adjacent to a lobby. And we want to ensure that um, gunmen can't uh, target the operator on the inside of that. I had, a, I had a client a couple of years ago that had a large glass window just outside the lobby that looked right into their control room. And this was hugely vulnerable. So uh, in that case, we recommended uh, upgrading the glazing with the use of bullet-resistant glass. I also have uh, run into a handful of school clients where we had, uh, uh, one example was a pre-K a couple of years ago where it was just one large open room and during a lockdown situation, during an active shooter threat, they moved all the kids into one single bathroom, very densely packed. And in that case, the gunman didn't even need to get inside of the room. All he needed to do was fire through the door and guaranteed striking targets on the other side. So in that case, um, upgrading those doors to that restroom with the use of uh, uh, bullet-resistant doors was part of my recommendations to them. Now, if you're going to be... Uh, uh, implementing bullet-resistant materials in these kinds of situations. There's several different specification standards to be aware of. If you're in Europe, EN 1063 is the king when it comes to specifying bullet-resistant materials, construction materials, doors, and glazing. 
And if that was the case, I would be looking for a BR-5 rating, which would basically provide protection against an AK-47 or 5.56 millimeter uh, rifle, such as an AR-15. In the United States, ASTM F-1233 and UL-752 are the most common rating systems uh, or used for specifying construction materials. And under these ratings, I would be looking for at least a uh, 1233 R1 rating or a UL752 level 7 rating or greater. A more ideal specification would be R3 or level 8. Now, it would provide protection up to uh, 7.62 NATO. Although, truthfully, the vast majority of active shooter attacks where um, assault rifles were used or uh, assault carbines in the United States were 5.56 millimeter weapons. So in that case, the level 7 or the R1 would be uh, quite sufficient for this purpose. Now, what about using um, offices and, uh, and various rooms inside of our facilities that are equipped with access uh, control systems, maybe card readers, for use as safe rooms? I usually discourage that. And the reason why is because if the attacker happens to be an employee that has an access card, an access badge, or if an attacker recovers one off a fallen employee, then that compromises any security provided by those door locks. So in these cases, I always recommend the use of mechanical locks for this kind of purpose on safe rooms that we're going to be using in our facility. And whatever you do in terms of locks, particularly on egress doors, please avoid the use of mag locks. Mag locks present a bunch of different problems when it comes to these types of situations. Now, first, let me back up and say mag locks have got a lot of very useful functions. There's a lot of, as a, you know, as a consultant, there's a lot of areas where I do recommend using mag locks, including even in situations where I'm dealing with active shooter related risk, but usually for the purposes of unlocking normally locked doors through a, uh, through a lockdown macro um, for use as safe rooms. Um, but overall, I usually discourage it. And for a couple of reasons. Number one, they fail safe during fire alarms. And we have had a number of situations in the past. And for those that aren't aware what that means when I say fail safe, meaning that they, that they unlock when the fire alarm is activated in the building. It's required under, uh, under international building code and municipal fire codes. The the, the problem in this case, we've had a number of situations where the attackers activated fire alarms in buildings. The 2015 attack at the Corinthia Hotel was one, as well as also at UCF that same year. In that case, um, James, or, um, my apologies, uh, yeah, James uh, Siva Kumar, who actually pulled the fire alarm pulse station in order to provoke an evacuation of the, the building. Quite similar thing uh, occurring again at the Corinthia Hotel. And then we've had situations like uh, the Parkland shooting where Nicholas Cruz's rifle on the uh, ground level floor activated the fire alarm. And then we have had situations like the, uh, like the Washington Navy Yard incident in 2013, where a good Samaritan in the building, somebody trying to warn people that an attack was in progress, activated the fire alarm manually um, to, as a warning to people. So in this case, activating that fire alarm in any way would serve as a master key, unlocking all of those normally locked doors. The second is that they require a sensor or push to exit switch to facilitate exit when the fire alarm is not activated. And that presents a different type of uh, a problem. A lot of facilities that I run into that are using mag locks for this kind of purpose rely solely on a small little push to exit switch mounted somewhere near the door. Or in some cases, I find them even a meter or farther away from the door which under high stress conditions as people are running down the hallway, they now suddenly got to stop and look around, find that push to exit switch before that door unlocks. And in the case of exit sensors, I often run into other different types of problems. I had a school that I did a project for a couple of years ago that um, they, the exit sensors basically just kept unlocking the doors all day long as people were walking down the hallway. An intrusion into, those, uh, into that building would have been as simple as just standing on the other side of the door and listening for a click. So in general, my preferred option, and whenever I'm specifying uh, uh, locks for this kind of purpose, especially on egress doors, is the use of uh, mechanical exit bar devices and electric, uh, or electrified exit bar devices or mechanical exit bar devices and electric strikes. 
And by the way, this whole thing about the push to exit switch is not a hypothetical or theoretical concern. 17 people died at the uh, door, an exit door, at the Alnor Mosque in Christchurch in 2019 in New Zealand simply because nobody could find that push to exit switch that was located adjacent to the door. In fact, the people that escaped out of that door broke through the glass to get out of the building. That was an avoidable tragedy just by specifying different kinds of hardware. So again, the preferred approach would be utilizing electrified exit bar devices and latch systems or electric strikes and mechanical exit bars. Now, as far as the security level provided by the exit bars and the, uh, and, and, you know, and the, uh, the electric strikes, if my primary threat is a gunman using a rifle, then simply anything that provides a reasonable level of intrusion resistance is going to be sufficient. I'm usually not going to be uh, recommending uh, um, exit bar devices that utilize multiple locking points and things like that. Now, in a high security application or we're protecting high valued assets or we're concerned about group attack or something like this, then that may be warranted. But for most commercial applications, workplace applications, schools, churches and other locations like this, most of the uh, exit bar devices that are out there in the market and most of the electric strikes that are out there in the market are going to be just fine for, uh, for these purposes, for, for delay. And whatever you do, please do not use delayed egress doors in your facilities. This is a big problem. Anything that slows people down from escaping potentially means casualties. Um, International Building Code, for instance, permits delayed egress up to 30 seconds on doors in occupancies except for assembly, educational, and high hazard. However, in spite of that, I find this all over the place. And I'll tell you where I find it a lot is Europe. In fact, I find a lot of building code violations in general when I'm in Europe, more so than I do in the United States. The doors that you're seeing on slide right now are actually inside of a, uh, an exhibition hall in London. And employing, again, 30-second delayed egress. That's an A assembly. And the reason why I point this out, in, uh, I actually made a video a couple of years ago specifically for making this case to clients. Um, I had a, a, a corporate client that was using delayed egress on all of their exit doors from stairwells inside of their uh, office buildings on their corporate campus. And as I was making this case, they were very resistant initially because they were trying to discourage employees from exiting um, through doors that weren't designated exit points. And that was why I made this video, was to try to make the case as for how long 30 seconds is during an active shooter attack. I think that makes the case better than I could explain it, actually. And probably one of the uh, worst examples I ever saw this kind of thing, one of my greatest concerns was actually another exhibition hall in Europe where there wasn't even push to exit switches or exit sensors on the, uh, on the access control doors. Instead, we had a, um, a, 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 a large turnstile revolving door at the main entrance, and that was where they wanted to channel everybody in and out. And in this case, they were reliant on a control room in order to manually unlock those doors during an active shooter incident. This was a huge concern for me. And I actually ended up, uh, it, it kind of aroused my curiosity. I found myself spending uh, about a half an hour walking throughout the building, looking 
other similar types of egress concerns. And truthfully, this place was a death trap. How this was uh, permissible under code or they got exceptions for this, I don't know. It's uh, a local government issue thing, I suppose. Now, on the subject of access control, if we are concerned about, if we have an access control system employed in our facility, or we wish to improve our level of readiness in order to lock our building down quickly and, uh, and reliably when an attack is in progress, access control software systems, security management systems can be programmed in such a manner as to automate a lot of building lockdown functions. And where I find this most useful is if we have an outdoor threat concern and a large number of attacks do commence outdoors before progressing indoors. That provides us with an easy way of locking down any kind of unlocked doors or doors that are normally in an unlocked state. And there's a lot of situations where this can be very valuable. Um, I employ this quite a bit with regard to schools, where we have certain kinds of um, buildings that require flexible access, like gymnasiums and cafeterias and media centers and places like this, where it's just not practical to keep them in a locked state throughout the course of the day. And this provides us with an easy way of locking those doors down fast. Another example is um, in houses of worship and in other types of public buildings where we have people coming and going and ordinarily, you know, it, it would be impractical to use other types of measures in order to, uh, to delay them. However, when an attack is in progress outdoors, we want to have the ability to lock that building down very, very fast. Disabling turnstiles and lobbies Disabling elevators, if permitted by code, releasing or uh, closing deployable delay doors, something that we don't really have time to go into in this, but I did get into in another presentation recently after the Capitol Hill riot. Um, locking doors to group assembly rooms. So if we have large assembly areas, auditoriums, church sanctuaries, um, other areas like this, where large numbers of potential targets, target people are going to be located at, and those doors are ordinarily kept in an unlocked state, this would also lock those doors too. And um, as I mentioned a moment ago, unlocking normally locked rooms for use by occupants as safe rooms, if equipped with alternative mechanical locks. And this gives you an example of how we might apply this. Um, in this case, uh, a large church. This was actually from a project I did a couple of years back where um, one of my greatest concerns in this instance in this situation. Now, this, this church had a security team and the security team members were all equipped with hex keys capable of locking the mechanical exit bars on the exterior doors of the building. And their original plan was that the security team members, when an outdoor threat was recognized, were going to run around and lock all these doors. Never going to happen in the real world. Never. Um, another part of this problem was that the sanctuary doors um, or the doors leading into the sanctuary had no locks at all. So in this particular case, what I recommended was installing um, locks on the doors to the sanctuary, um, access controlled locks. In fact, in that case, it was uh, uh, exit bar devices with vertical bolts. And um, likewise, on the exterior doors, installing electrified exit bar devices as well. And they did have a uh, control room during church services, operative on scene. And then ensuring that the operator inside the control room through the security management system could rapidly lock down with a button press, ergonomically easy, simple, something that could be done under high stress conditions, all those exterior doors and the doors to the actual sanctuary. And that's represented by all the red dots that you see up on the slide right now. These are all doors that would have been controlled by that lockdown macro, as it were. And then the others representing doors that are either mechanically locked or operated, um, you know, by, uh, by, by staff badges only. Emergency egress should be an important point of your planning for active shooter attacks. And this, candidly, is something I find often overlooked in a lot of active shooter preparation and is often uh, a major issue of concern for me in some facilities. Now, all of our facilities are required in order to comply with life safety codes. You know, International Building Code, NFPA here in the United States, you know, obviously we have different kinds of municipal codes or national variations of these codes, but almost all of which are built off of International Building Code. These fire codes or life safety codes were largely designed with fire in mind. And some of the unique things um, that we find 
behaviorally and circumstantially in active shooter events, they don't really address very well. Um, I don't want to get, because of time, I don't want to get too much into depth on that matter, but I do want to point out some important considerations beyond the provisions that may be in place already within your fire plans or within your uh, existing life safety plan. First of all, emergency exits should be clearly marked and easy to locate under stress. That is a very basic point. If the location of exits is not obvious, consider installing additional directional signage in hallways. When I'm doing assessments, active shooter assessments of buildings, I will stop in almost every hallway and look around. And if I can't find a sign that accurately directs me to a, a point of egress, it gets marked on my notes. We need to have one in that location. And all exit routes and stairwells should ideally be kept clear of obstructions as well. In the real world, we often do find a lot of problems in these matters. Um, on the left-hand side is an example of an emergency exit sign obscured by a wall. And, and part of the problems that I run into sometimes is signage was installed correctly when the building was first constructed, but then there had been additional build-out that had been done over time. New walls that had been constructed, maybe new offices that were put in place and things like this. And they never really updated the signage. And as a result, we either have obstructed signage or incorrect signage. On the left is an example of the obscured signage. There, uh, through the door that you see on the left, and you can see a door on the far side, that is actually the lobby of this particular building. And in this case, the exit sign is obscured by a new wall that had been constructed. Solving this is relatively easy. Just put a new sign above the door that you see where the arrow is pointing right now. And at least somebody standing in this area, which is actually kind of an executive wing inside of this building, would tell me where to go. On the right-hand side, we have an, a bi-directional exit sign and an access control uh, or an access controlled door in front of it. So if somebody, and, and this, by the way, was actually located in a conference center. So um, yeah, it, long story short, this building, when it was originally constructed, had one huge open floor plan. And what they did eventually was they built a conference center and they divided the conference center from the existing call center with um, new walls and with the doors that you're looking at right now. So if you're located in the conference center when an attack is in progress and you run this direction, guided by other signs nearby, you're now greeted with these locked doors and this bi-directional exit sign. Where do I go at this point? Well, actually, the, the proper answer to that is to the door that was on the right-hand side, which had no signage at all. Very confusing situation here. Failing to update signage after building cubicle workspaces. This is a kind of a related problem to what I just discussed on the last slide. And this is very common. I run into this a, a lot with uh, offices that have big open cubicle uh, workspaces, um, call centers. This is very common with two. So in this case, if you were following the exit signage, you would run into this area on the left-hand side with cubicles, and now you got a bi-directional exit signage telling you to go left or you go right. You go either direction, you just end up being trapped inside of cubicles. On the right-hand side is another example of the kinds of problems we often run into cubicle workspaces, and that's obstructed exit signage, where you can't see it from inside of um, these, uh, this maze or this labyrinth of cubicles. Obstructed exits is also a very common problem. On the left-hand side is an example of a makeshift break area um, that was you know, basically because of space put right in front of an emergency exit door. On the right-hand side is an, an Alzheimer's ward inside of a, uh, uh, a, a medical clinic that I did a couple of years back. And in that case, they intentionally obstructed the door because they wanted to try to keep the Alzheimer's patients from going out and sending off the alarm persistently. I explained to them we can't do that you know, for, for all the reasons that we're talking about right now. Here's some other examples. On the left-hand side is an emergency exit corridor from a stairwell inside of a commercial office building. On the right-hand side is the backstage theater area inside of a school, which, by the way, in schools, theaters and gymnasiums are the two locations where I often find a lot of this ob obstruction stuff just because they don't have adequate storage space. So the exit quarters or the areas near exit doors often end up becoming kind of overflow storage. And here was a different kind of problem. This was actually um, a, pro a major problem for me in this instance. We're running down the hallway trying to get away from an active shooter, and now suddenly we're greeted by this bank of four doors. Which door do I go through? One, two, three, or four? 
no indication just based on signage here right now. Well, here was the problem. Door on the left and the door on the right were kept in a locked state, Man mechanically locked. Couldn't exit through an exit bar or anything like this at all. And then the two doors in the center were equipped with mag locks with an exit sensor. So the only way you could escape through these doors would have been through the center two doors. But if you ran far to the left or you ran far to the right, you were greeted with a locked door and you'd just be pulling and pulling and pulling or pushing and pushing and pushing and it would be going anywhere. In fact, my recommendation to them in this case was if they were not going to replace the hardware on those doors with mechanical exit bars was to um, remove the doors, install new wall section, even glazing. And then if they do install glazing, make sure that it's um, obvious that it's not an exit path, you know, such as frosting the glass or, you know, putting curtains up or something like this. Nondescript or missing signage is another common problem. Um, center is kind of obvious. In this case, we have an exit sign, but it almost disappears, you know, uh, against that wall. On the left-hand side is the base of a stairwell. There's actually two doors at the base of that stairwell. I only got a picture of one there. The one on the left, which you can't see in the photograph, would have led you back into occupied spaces in the lower levels of the building, which in these types of events are the most dangerous areas inside of buildings quite typically. The proper exit door is the one that you see in the photograph, which has no exit sign at all. Now, during the daytime, that's not a big problem because you can see light coming in through the vision panel. At night, however, you can't see that. So running down these stairs, I have no idea which way to go, left or go right. And if I go left through that door, I could be entering right into harm's way, first floor of the building. And then on the far right-hand side is an example of an emergency exit door where they didn't have a, a sign above the door. Instead, they just posted a sheet of paper saying that this is a designated emergency exit. Again, somebody running in this direction under high stress conditions is unlikely going to recognize that. Another common problem, or, or I shouldn't say a common problem, but another problem that comes up occasionally is limited egress options. And where I most often run into this kind of thing aren't newly constructed buildings, but usually buildings that were constructed 50 years ago, 100 years ago, or like in Europe and other locations like this, maybe hundreds of years ago. And this is a good example of this. This is the Leopold Cafe in Mumbai, attacked in uh, 2008 by Lashkari Taiba, one of the actually several different locations, uh, 11 locations altogether targeted that night. This was actually one of the first. In fact, the, uh, the terrorist assault team that um, opened fire on occupants inside the Leopold Cafe that night moved on to the Taj Mahal Hotel, which is only about three blocks away from this area. Um, I, whenever I travel internationally and I'm going to a city where there's been major attacks, I always try to pay homage and actually visit these locations because it gives me a better appreciation for the geography than simply what we get in reports and things and looking at diagrams and Google Maps and all this kind of stuff. And what I never knew before was that on the second level of the Leopold Cafe was a small eating area. And on the night of the attack, there was about 20 people that were located up in that area. I actually had dinner that night in that same location. And that's uh, pointed out by that red ring that you see up in the image right now. Only one way up there, one way out, nowhere to hide up on that second level. Fortunately for the people that were eating dinner up there that night, the terrorists didn't bother spending much time here. Instead, they entered, in fact, they, were, they, they opened fire exactly where I was in this, you know, when I took this photograph, standing in this exact position. Basically, the Leopold Cafe just has these big open doors from the, uh, from the street. They just walked right up, tossed a couple grenades and began opening fire on everybody inside. And fortunately, were either unaware or didn't bother trying to go up to that second level where those two, 20 people were trapped. We had a similar kind of problem at the Bataclan Theater as well. And it, at the Bataclan Theater, the, there were two emergency exits which discharged into an alley on the south side of the building. And then we had exits also at the main entrance in the front of the building. Keep in mind, in these attacks... People are not going to try to escape in the direction of harm's way. So if the gunmen are near the main entrance, opening up fire on people inside of the building, they're going to naturally, their intuitive reaction is going to be to run away from the direction of danger. Well, almost all the people that were inside of this building that were either caught on the dance floor area or on the second level, on the north side in particular of the building, had nowhere to go. 
no alternative exits. And the only people that really escaped effectively through those south side exits were people that were located on the south side when the gunfire erupted or those people that took a chance and ran across the gun, uh, rather uh, 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 across the, uh, the dance floor area when the gunfire erupted. Um, this was a major problem in that, in that case. If there had been exits on the north side of the building and the west side of the building, probably would have been a lot more uh, people that would have su uh, successfully escaped in this situation. And another place where I run into this occasionally, um, kind of a variation of the problem, which I would say is limited exit capacity, has been attacks against church sanctuaries. In, uh, again, in these cases, most of the attacks originate from the entrance into the sanctuary itself. And then people intuitively, if they can get to those exits, church sanctuaries present a bunch of problems, one of which is the uh, tight confinement presented by church pews. And also often we have uh, in large church sanctuaries, multiple tiers that present a trip hazard then for people that are trying to run or escape. And in the two examples that you see on uh, screen right now, the attack directed against the Tennessee Valley uh, Unitarian Universalist Church and the First Baptist Church in Sutherland Springs, there was only two small one-door exits at the front of the church sanctuaries. And most people couldn't get to those locations. And even if they could, the small number of exit doors in those areas would have resulted in congestion, which could have also contributed further to casualties. We also run into this quite often in nightclubs. It's another location where I run into this kind of thing as well. Pulse nightclub being one example. Recommendation in this particular circumstance is almost going to always be improving exit capacity in those areas, like towards the front of the sanctuary, or towards the back of the nightclub, the direction where intuitively we suspect based upon where the threat's most likely going to originate, people are going to run. So in this particular example, where we only have um, on the left-hand side, the before image, knowing that the threat is most likely going to enter the sanctuary from the back side through the, uh, the interior of the church building, as it were, knowing that people are most likely going to be running and their only path of escape is going to be those two small little exit doors on the front of the sanctuary is installing additional exit doors. Um, in this case, multiple different exit doors that would allow people that are running through the aisles between pews in order to quickly access an emergency exit. Emergency exit stairwell should ideally discharge directly outdoors. During armed attacks, the lower levels of the building, most attacks originate at ground level. And the public spaces inside ground level and the areas like the lobbies and whatnot are often going to be the most dangerous areas inside of the building. And if we have a building like the, uh, like the, the represented by the floor plan that you see right here, where we have interior stairwells that discharge into the lobby area or into public corridors and then other alternative stairwells that discharge or at least provide a direct path to discharging outdoors, it would be important in active shooter training to educate employees on this matter so that they know do not use the center stairwell. Instead, only use the south side stairwell or the north side stairwell, whatever it is, that discharges directly outside. And this, um, this image right now represents another kind of problem that I've run into occasionally. This was, um, in this circumstance, I was brought in as a consultant in the 11th hour of a new building renovation. It was a historical building that was being converted into a community center. And they did a third floor addition that was going to be used for children's activities. And when, when they designed it, they designed it so that the exit stairwell from that third level went down to the second floor but then required traveling down the second floor corridor into another stairwell in order to exit out the building. How this passed inspection, you know, or when they were, uh, you know, presenting the plans initially getting approval, I don't know. But this created a very complex movement path that also not only created complexity in terms of escape, go down this hallway, go down that hallway, get into this stairwell, that kind of thing. It also moved people through interior spaces, which again, you know, when an attack is in progress, could be potentially dangerous. So my advice in this particular case, because there was no other options at this stage, was to build a robust safe room on that third floor level, because there wasn't one at that time, so that they had some kind of location and make sure that the people that are operating those, that child care operation know that escape is not a safe choice in this particular circumstance. 
Now, earlier at the beginning of this presentation, we talked briefly about time, about um, response time, you know, time for detection, time for the response force travel time, and time for intervention. And we talked about the adversary task time very briefly as well. Time matters in these events. It's absolutely critical. Anything that expedites response and intervention has a direct bearing on reducing the number of casualties. And this is borne out by multiple different studies. Usually when I approach this matter um, in the classroom working with security professionals, I do it from the angle of performance-based physical security design. And we even do exercises in some of my workshops using the estimate of adversary sequence interruption model, looking at a before situation and then modeling out potential improvements. And when we do that, I can quantify, I can show mathematically how certain things that we do to improve response time in terms of uh, response force intervention has a huge impact in terms of reducing the likelihood of that attacker's success. Well, Purdue University approached it from a different angle and they use computer-based uh, 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 modeling in order to evaluate different types of response scenarios and input data from 65 different workplace and school shootings. And this is basically summarizes the results of that assessment. Now, when they did it, they looked at what they called basic response, which was off-site 911 response, what they're calling res resource officers, basically an on-site armed responder. And mind you, this was done with the idea of a uh, school security in mind. And then they also modeled out percentages of the population, employees, teachers in this case, being armed, concealed carry weapon permit holders with, with firearms. And they modeled out what the time to interruption would have been. They're calling time to engagement and the number of potential casualties. And um, you can see there was a, a huge difference between the resource officer and the basic level 911 offsite response. I mean, this is kind of an obvious point, but every time we really look at this closely, we keep seeing the same trend. When we're relying on off-site responders, quite often we end up with tragic consequences, um, which is why I am a huge advocate of having on-site armed responders when it is an option. Now, I realize in many countries that we have people on this call that are from Europe and other places like this that may not be a practical option, may not even be an available option. But where it is possible, I strongly recommend it. And I'll tell you um, where I really emphasize it is when we have large facilities like the Virginia Beach Municipal Center or the Washington Navy Yard building. And those incidents, it took 37 and 38 minutes to search the building and locate the adversaries. And it was offsite responders that were coming in, people that weren't familiar with the building, didn't have that home ground advantage, as it were, in terms of knowing the geography. And that contributed to that, uh, to that delay time or to that uh, 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 delayed, we'll say, time of intervention. Now, if you do have armed security personnel on site, it is strongly recommended that if you post them in stationary areas, that you provide them with a minimum of two seconds to three seconds of opportunity to recognize an attack is in progress and respond. A uh, problem that I run into in a number of facilities is they will post an armed officer immediately at the front entrance, believing that that officer is going to present a deterrent against an attacker coming in. A good example, I had a Jewish community organization that I worked with several years back that had an armed sheriff's deputy in a parking lot out front, and he was the only armed responder on site. And the way I explained it to them at the time is, he's your canary in the coal mine. He's the first one who's going to get killed when the shooting begins. He needs to be positioned in an area inside of the building where he has a minimum of two to three seconds of delay. And two seconds, by the way, is theoretically minimal. That's just the amount of time it takes to recognize it and a threat and then initiate a response, like draw a weapon from a holster and fire. And um, that two seconds that you're seeing right there is actually based on testing that we've done on firearms ranges where somebody's hitting a buzzer and people are drawing weapons and then shooting a target. In the real world, it's Thursday afternoon at two o'clock, you know, same old, same old as it's been the last few weeks, that reaction time is going to be even slower. So three seconds would be much more preferred in those circumstances. And we have had situations like this where security personnel and police personnel have been surprised in these kinds of attacks and were unable to respond. One example happened at the Canadian Parliament Center Block building back in 2014. 
where a Michael Z.F. Babeau had just shot a, uh, a soldier across the street, ran over to the entrance, shot another officer as he was entering into the rotunda area, and then ran right past a group of armed officers. No barriers, no secure lobby area, uh, like we discussed earlier in this program, and ran right past um, uh, an occupied caucus room, all the way down to where the Library of Parliament was, where he was eventually neutralized. And in this case, we had nobody positioned in an area that had adequate opportunity to recognize an attack and then stop and intervene the attacker. Another instance of this was the 2009 attack at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, where uh, James Von Brun, a white supremacist, shot uh, Special Police Officer Stephen Johns at the front door and then entered inside. Johns had actually been holding the door open for him when, at the time that he got shot. Didn't even have a chance to get his weapon out of his holster. Um, we've had a number of attacks like this over the years. You know, the attack at the al Jedawal compound back in 2003 by al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Same thing. In that case, it was a vehicle entry control point, but two personnel, including the one armed officer that was supposed to be providing overwatch, both neutralized at close range by surprise. So we always want to make sure that we're providing that uh, opportunity. Um, getting back to that Jewish community center I mentioned a minute ago, my recommendation to them was if they wanted to have an armed officer outside for deterrence purposes, to have at least another one inside to serve as the reliable responder. Or put somebody unarmed, save some money, put an unarmed security officer out front, and then have that armed sheriff's deputy on the inside of the building where he's going to have proper opportunity to recognize, assess the situation, and then tactically respond. And if we do have armed officers in uh, lobbies and areas like this, provide them an advantage by planning, pre-positioning bullet-resistant barrier materials, cover, as we refer to it in the tactical world, um, that they can take um, uh, protection behind and provide them with a defensive advantage. And that can be accomplished with the use of things like concrete, uh, uh, you know, planters inside of lobbies that look unobtrusive, you know, aesthetically pleasing. There are also uh, trash cans that are made as uh, uh, for uh, not exactly this kind of purpose. They're made actually for blast purposes, um, but they also are bullet resistant. That could be placed inside of the lobby as well. And they would be positioned nearby wherever that armed officer is going to be. In some designs that I've done over the last few years, I've recommended having a uh, security officer desk in the lobby that is actually constructed with bullet resistant materials. U.L. 752 level 7 rated, you know, uh, you know, fiberglass panels, for instance, so that the officer could quickly take cover right behind it and provide him with a defensible advantage. What about CCTV in these circumstances? Truthfully, if it's not monitored live, I usually don't make many recommendations on CCTV when I'm focusing on active shooter risk. If it is, if we do have, however, a control room on site, then CCTV can be uh, very uh, useful particularly if we have a prolonged event or a hostage barricade type situation. We've had at least two incidents in the past, the 2015 attack at the Corinthia Hotel Tripoli and the 2008 Taj Mahal Palace Hotel attack, where on-site control rooms were able to monitor the movement of the attackers throughout the building and relay critical details. And in the case of the Corinthia Hotel attack, the, um, they, those guys were heroes. Ironically, I just got a message on LinkedIn this morning from one of the guys that was in that control room that day. Um, they deserve a medal. They not only were alerting security forces, but they were manually calling all the hotel rooms inside of the hotel and warning people what was in progress. And they just did an astounding job, stayed operational the entire time that the attack was in progress. In the case of 2008 in Mumbai, that control room was uh, operational for maybe about an hour and a half before fire threatened its location and they had to abandon the location at that point. But they were at least able to monitor the movement of the attackers relaying this information. In fact, two police officers even made their way to that control room when the uh, attack, shortly after the attack had started. Now, in addition to all these other physical security related measures, we also want to make sure we have effective communications infrastructure in our facilities, accounting for alerting authorities, personnel on site, and any kind of emergency team communications as well. Um, and that may include making sure that we program our telephone systems for simplicity using easy to remember numbers that are ergonomically simple to use to call authorities or our security control room. 
um, if we do not have a public address system, but we have a contemporary phone system on site, that can often be leveraged for public address purposes as well by simply programming an all-call capability and then making sure that we have good audibility throughout the facility by installing speakers or good speaker coverage. If, on the other hand, we have a, uh, a more conventional paging type system, public address system, then in this case, I strongly recommend that you have multiple paging stations or ensure that that system, if it's uh, a modern system, that it can be dialed into remotely for the purposes of making an emergency announcement. One of the problems that I run into a lot with these kinds of systems is that there's often a limited number of base stations and they're often in very vulnerable areas like reception desks right there at the main entrance. You know, probably one of the most vulnerable locations or dangerous locations in the building during an attack. And any kind of PA system that relies on a phone at a fire panel, like in a multi-tenant building or something like this, should just be regarded as unusable. You're never going to be able to access that utility room when an attack is in progress and make that announcement. And I actually ran into this as a problem recently with a, um, a multi-tenant building that I was working with. Um, where they had floor captains on different suites for different tenants located throughout the building, and they needed some way to warn everybody inside of the building. And there was just no way that we could rely on um, uh, this system. So instead, it was utilizing a digital mass notification system. And this, by the way, is something I universally recommend for everybody as a redundant communication measure in these kinds of emergencies, having some kind of mass notification system. And there's tons of them out there on the market these days that have different levels of functionality. Some of them tend to work better in corporate environments. And there's others that I primarily recommend maybe for schools. And in fact, so many of them have different advantages and disadvantages, pros and cons, strengths and weaknesses, as it were, that um, after searching the market for years for one that I universally like, that doesn't have a lot of weaknesses, we actually uh, worked with the manufacturer in order to produce one that is um, in beta right now. It's called Guardian Call, which basically initiates multiple different kinds of alerts just by simply the push of a button. Now, the model that you're seeing on screen right now is actually, um, it was the Alpha. We actually now have a second uh, generation technology device that is an LCD screen, touch screen, that kind of thing, and biometric sensors. So we can even detect if somebody has elevated heart rate or stops having a heart rate, indicating potentially a person that's been fallen. But it, essentially, one push of the button initiates multiple different notifications, including audible announcement to all the other devices throughout the facility. Just to kind of explain where the idea for this system came up, after working with multiple different kinds of clients, and especially with schools, finding deficiencies in public inf uh, communications infrastructure, public address infrastructure, I had had this magic wish list in my head for a long time of the perfect mass notification system and nothing existed out there in the market that addressed it. And so when we finally met a technology developer that had this capability and started, uh, you know, I had kind of laid out Craig's magic wish list of all these different features that started the ball in motion. And hopefully um, we will, I know we just got new prototypes recently or whatever of the devices. Hopefully we'll have this out to market within the next couple of months. And whatever you do in these kinds of incidents, regardless of whatever kind of communications infrastructure you have, do not use the fire alarm to communicate any other kind of emergency but fire. That's an obvious point. But um, this has come up several times over the years. Um, I even had a, uh, a government organization in Europe that asked me about this in training. Um, in fact, I was kind of surprised when I was asked the question because I thought it was kind of an obvious answer. And then when I after the class was over with and I dug into it, I found out why they asked that question. And it was because they did not have any kind of public address systems in their buildings. All they had was a fire alarm. When I met with them, their, uh, their head of security for that organization later on, my advice for him was the next euro you spend on upgrades for your buildings needs to be getting public address systems installed. Um, there's no way that you can audibly communicate to building occupants a proper emergency alert in these kinds of situations without that infrastructure. And even a mass notification system, unless it's got audible announcement capabilities like that guardian call that I mentioned a moment ago, shouldn't be regarded really as reliable either for this purpose. It should always be audible announcement as the first means of communication. Mass notification digitally only should be redundant 
um, or considered only as a redundant communication measure. Well, I thank everybody for uh, joining me today. I hope you got some useful information out of the program. If any of you uh, that are on this call require any kind of uh, communication support, um, I would be more than happy to go ahead and help you out. Uh, it'd be my pleasure in the future. Um, if for those that are online right now that are uh, uh, interested in learning more about these matters, I have some seminars coming up in the near future. A lot of these topics we go into in much greater depth, um, as well as a whole spectrum of other different types of uh, uh, threats as it relates to terrorism. In the Anti-Terrorism Officer course, I have one coming up in a couple of weeks where we still have available seats. And then we also have another one scheduled in November. And then we have an emergency response planning workshop coming up in September, which gets into many of these matters too, particularly as it relates to the response planning side of it, as well as a whole spectrum of other different types of uh, hazards. And then we also have our assessing terrorism related risk workshop scheduled for June and July, which is uh, kind of a neat program. It's actually focusing more on risk assessment and vulnerability assessment in support of security planning.